Hi, this is Peter from Anatomy Zone and in this tutorial we're going to take a brief look at the autonomic nervous system. In this tutorial I'd like to introduce you to some of the basic anatomical concepts of the autonomic nervous system and we'll take a little look at the functions at the end. The autonomic nervous system consists of two main divisions, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system and these are functionally and anatomically distinct and the functions are often antagonistic, which means they often do opposite things to each other. So in terms of location, the sympathetic outflow originates in the thoracolumbar regions of the spinal cord. So this extends from spinal segments T1 to L2. The parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, is referred to as craniosacral. So it has cranial nerve components and sacral components. So the cranial nerves which are involved are cranial nerves 3, 7, 9 and 10, which is the ocular motor, facial, glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve. And the sacral components are sacral regions S2 to S4. Now the next point that I want to make about the autonomic nervous system is the difference in the efferent component in comparison to the somatic nervous system. So what we're looking at here in the bottom diagram is a representation of the somatic nervous system and on the top we've got a representation of the autonomic nervous system. So just to refresh your memory on the basic makeup of the somatic nervous system, we've got a peripheral stimulus being picked up by a sensory receptor and this peripheral stimulus gets brought back into the central nervous system by the sensory neuron. The sensory neuron has, if you remember, the cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion and this pseudo-unipolar neuron passes via the dorsal root into the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. And these sensory fibres ascend to the brain via the dorsal columns or the anterolateral system, the spinothalamic tract, in which case they would cross over and ascend. Now it's the efferent component that I want to draw your attention to. So we've got the motor neuron, the motor component of the somatic nervous system originating in the ventral horn of the spinal cord in the grey matter and it leaves via this ventral root and then it has this single neuron which innervates the skeletal muscle and results in contraction. So the key here is that there's one single neuron in the efferent component of the somatic nervous system which extends from the central nervous system to the periphery. The efferent component of the autonomic nervous system is different. There are two sets of neurons between the CNS and the PNS. So we've got this neuron here which is called the preganglionic neuron. So it leaves via the ventral horn just like the diagram below, exits along the ventral root and now the difference here is that it forms a synapse in a ganglion. So a ganglion is simply a collection of neuronal cell bodies that are outside the central nervous system. So this preganglionic neuron synapses onto the postganglionic neuron, which then innervates the target organ. In this case, it's the smooth muscle wall of a blood vessel. So the key concept here is that there are two sets of neurons between the CNS and the PNS in the autonomic nervous system. You've got the preganglionic neuron which is the neuron before the autonomic ganglion and then you've got the postganglionic neuron which extends to the target organ. So the location of this ganglion might be in the sympathetic chain in the paravertebral ganglia in the case of the sympathetic nervous system or in the case of the parasympathetic nervous system most ganglia are located either in or near to the target organs. So the cell bodies of the preganglionic neuron are located either in the spinal cord or in the brain. And the axons of these preganglionic neurons are myelinated, whereas the postganglionic neurons are not myelinated. So other anatomical differences to know about between sympathetic and parasympathetic are the lengths of the pre- and postganglionic axons. So the length of the preganglionic axon in the case of the sympathetic nervous system is relatively short. So I've just drawn on a preganglionic axon here again in red. And if we imagine that this ganglion here is representative of the paravertebral ganglia, so a ganglion within the sympathetic chain, this would be located just adjacent to the vertebral column. So the preganglionic neuron in this case would be very short. 
the postganglionic neuron would then extend from the side of the vertebral column to the target organ. So the postganglionic neuron is relatively long. Now in the case of the parasympathetic nervous system, the ganglia are often located either near to or actually within the target organ. So in this case, the preganglionic neuron has a longer distance to travel in order to form this synapse with the postganglionic neuron. And then obviously the postganglionic neuron will then be relatively shorter in the case of the parasympathetic nervous system. So the next thing I want to talk about is the neurotransmitters within the autonomic nervous system. There are two main neurotransmitters, acetylcholine and noradrenaline. So noradrenaline is the same as norepinephrine. So this is a motor neuron of the somatic nervous system and the neurotransmitter in this instance is acetylcholine released at the neuromuscular junction. So what I've drawn here is a representation of the sympathetic nervous system. We've got the preganglionic neuron and the postganglionic neuron. The neurotransmitter released at the preganglionic neuron in both the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system is acetylcholine. So what I've drawn here is a representation of the sympathetic nervous system. We've got the preganglionic neuron in red and the postganglionic neuron in blue. So all preganglionic neurons in both the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system release acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. So almost all postganglionic sympathetic neurons, except those which innervate sweat glands, are noradrenergic. So that is, they secrete noradrenaline to their target organ. So the ones that do innervate sweat glands, they are acetylcholine secreting. So what I've drawn on here is the parasympathetic nervous system. So we've got the preganglionic neuron in red again, and then we've got the postganglionic neuron in blue. So the postganglionic neuron secretes acetylcholine in the parasympathetic nervous system. The final thing to mention is that the adrenal medulla is actually directly innervated by the preganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system. So in green I've drawn a preganglionic sympathetic nerve fibre directly innervating the adrenal medulla. And the adrenal medulla then releases adrenaline and noradrenaline directly into the circulation. So in terms of the functions of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, it's useful to think in terms of fight or flight for the sympathetic and rest and digest for the parasympathetic. And these mnemonics are quite broad, but they do give you an idea of the function of these two different divisions. So if you imagine the fight or flight response engaged in a caveman who's running away from the lion. So in response to the fight or flight mode being engaged, you get pupil dilation, so you can imagine that pupil dilation allows more light into the eye and then that can increase your visual acuity and you can see a nice escape route and run away from that line. The parasympathetic does the opposite and constricts the pupils. Also with regard to the eye, the sympathetic nervous system dilates the ciliary muscle allowing far vision, whereas the parasympathetic nervous system acts on the ciliary muscle to contract it and provide near vision. You also would need to increase your heart rate and increase your heart's contractility to increase your cardiac output to get away from the lion. So the sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate and contractility, whereas the parasympathetic decreases both these things. In the lungs, sympathetic activation dilates the bronchioles to allow more oxygen into the body, whereas the parasympathetic nervous system causes constriction of the bronchioles. So in terms of blood vessels, the blood vessels supplying the skin constrict and blood is shunted towards skeletal muscle. So this would allow the caveman to run away from that lion. In addition, the sweat glands in the skin are stimulated. You get increased sweating, so it's preparing for that increase in heat when you're about to run away or fight. And you also get contraction of the pilomotor muscles. Another thing you'll need is those energy substrates in your body to be mobilized. So the glycogen stores in your liver are mobilized and you get glycogen breakdown and an increase in blood sugar. So the parasympathetic in terms of its rest and digest function does the opposite of the things I mentioned. And in terms of the GI tract, it causes the smooth muscle walls of the digestive tract to contract and it causes the sphincters to relax. You get increased saliva secretion increased gastric acid secretion and increased pancreatic secretions. 
In terms of the bladder, you get detrusor muscle contraction and you get relaxation of the sphincter. And in terms of the male genitalia, the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for ejaculation, whereas the parasympathetic nervous system causes erection. So there's a simple mnemonic for remembering that. Point and shoot. So point, parasympathetic, causes erection, and shoot, sympathetic, causes ejaculation. So that's an easy way of remembering those two functions. So you can see how the fight or flight and rest and digest things can be applied to try and remember those different functions of the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. So that's an introduction to the autonomic nervous system. If you have found this video helpful, please click the like button, subscribe to our channel and make sure you check out some more of our videos. Thank you for watching.